Now we're going to begin to try to figure out what is a UFO. Okay? You may have heard of UFOs. Is everybody here familiar with the term UFO? UFO stands for Unidentified Flying Object. And from time to time, especially in the 50s, and from time to time people have observed, people have seen, there are many books on this, and there are all kinds of theories. Aliens from other planets. Last week we spoke about that there is no life elsewhere, as far as we know. As far as we know, there is no other life in the same form as we know. It doesn't mean that it's impossible, but as far as we know, there isn't. Then what are UFOs? Now, there's three kinds of UFOs. There is a lie, a fabrication, somebody made up the story, somebody wants to be famous, wants to appear in the newspaper, his picture. There, is, there are people like that. You have the individual who exaggerates something. You have ed mi pi ed, a witness from a witness. In other words, not first-hand information. He heard it from someone else. All of these are total lies. A great deal of testimony is untrue from the start. Then you have the genuine folks who saw something. They actually did see something, but it was not a UFO. It was a plane, it was a balloon, it was Superman, right? <laughs> a, they saw something, they don't know what it is. It's unusual. They've never seen it before. It could be a new plane. It could be anything. It could be strange lights in the sky. There are certain lights in the sky if you're in, over a, in a certain latitude reflections and so forth, yeah, from the sun, from the stars, shooting stars, there's all kinds of things. So these are, these are true sightings, but they're not something un so unusual, it's not something paranormal to say that this is an alien. But now we're going to talk about the ones that are real observations, real sightings of true UFOs. There are true UFOs, there are true uh, there, there, there is phenomena out there that is, I guess we can call it out of this world, not your typical, not your, not your normal occurrence. And for those of you who were here last week, you will understand what they are. If you read carefully through all the sightings that people have seen, the true ones, and you start listing the, the main highlights of what they saw and what happened, you will notice all the signs that prove that these are demons. In other words, the real UFO, and I'm not the only one to say so. There is a French researcher on UFOs who've, who has come to the same conclusion. There are a few. And I'll tell you why only they have come to this conclusion, not everybody else. You always have to remember the scientists and the skeptics who don't want to believe that there's anything. So we're, we're not going to even mention them. But the ones who are serious about this, and they analyze the real uh, testimony of honest individuals who really observed something, what you see, the common denominator will be the following. What do demons do? How do we know they're demons? Demons tend to make fun of human beings. Making fun meaning uh, poking fun at them, being satirical, uh, playing with them. Uh, they lie. That's another uh, characteristic that is seen. They hurt. They're not always friendly. They can hurt. Number four, they change different appearances. They can change color, shape, and form. They usually appear in deserts, rural places, and usually at night. Usually appear to only single individuals and not to groups of people. They fly in the air. They've been observed flying. And from time to time they also kidnap individuals. Take them with them. I just mentioned here, just listed to you, the common denominator 
of many, if you put together the few hundreds of cases, of the real cases, you will see, not all of them in every case, but you will see basically that these are, this is what stands out. And this is very characteristic of demons. All of these characteristics are very, very much seen in demons. And that is how we know. And the few researchers who were open about this idea came to this conclusion. Why didn't everybody else come to the same conclusion? Either because they're not open-minded that demons exist, or because they're unaware that these things existed in the past. They have existed in all the cultures, even in Japanese culture, in the old culture, Indian culture, there are paintings of demons and of all of these strange beings. And this is not myth. You know, some people will say, oh, this drawing is a myth of some myth mythical uh, monster that existed in the past. No, maybe it's not a myth at all. Maybe it is something true and maybe it comes close to being demonic in nature. Yes? Where do they, where do they live when they're not occasionally torturing? They're usually in rural places, in the deserts. So they, that's, where, that's where they actually they are all the time and then do they seek out people? No, I'll get to that. I'll get to that next. I'll get to that next. Yes? Are they sometimes helpful to the Yes. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that too, also. Yeah. Shedim ve mazikim. Lo ruchot. Ruchot ze mashu akher. Yes? What is the source of knowing that there are demons as opposed to thinking that it's a Vodazar? What, what, what do you mean by Vodazar? Like the other cultures would pray to. No, no, no. Let, let me ask you. No, no, no. Maybe you're not following me. You go out at night, imagine, to a very, very uh, rural place somewhere in uh, Tulare County. You know where that is? Yes. Okay. Most people don't. Okay. Northern California, which is very sparsely populated, right? And it's night. And all of a sudden you see a humanoid. You know what a humanoid is? Something that looks like a human being with slanty eyes, no hair, that's flying all over the place. What would you make of it? About the Zora? I mean, what, have, what does that have to do with the Zora? What is that? As they say, seeing is believing. I would find. It's a difficult offer of proof to accept that these things exist. Okay. Let me ask you another question. What happens if you see somebody that looks more human in nature? I might think it's a mongoloid or something. No, no, no. Somebody that looks more human in nature, just like anybody else, but he has chicken feet. <laughs> yeah. so my first reaction would be it's perhaps somebody with a birth defect. Right. See, because you're not, you were not exposed to, to, to all of this uh, literature that we have in the Gemara, in the Zohar, that describes the various types of demons that exist. Some look like goats. Some have chicken feet. Some are more human in the, in the way they appear. Some are less human. Some are more uh, monster-looking. Very, very strange-looking. Yes? That was last week's lecture. I don't want to repeat that now. Yeah. yeah, sure. And I'm going to tell you what the Gemara says, what to do about them, too. How to scare them away. <laughs> How to avoid them, yes. That's what I understand. Do you live in this world? Or? Yeah, they live in this world, but in a different dimension. Oh, so they can come in and out where they, you can see them? Right. We're, we're only used to the one dimension, right? No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that has nothing to do with Halloween, though. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The same dimension as angels? Not completely. No, not completely. The angels are in a different dimension somewhere. Yeah. So anyway... Now, you have to understand, why, so why am I bringing this up now? I mean, why is this important? Because we have to know what the Jewish position is on all this. Here we have a situation where somebody claims that there are aliens that there's other beings from other planets that are coming to invade, coming to attack, coming to take over, nobody knows what they want. And we're talking about honest, sincere individuals who, who will swear 
But they saw this, that they were kidnapped, they were in a spaceship. And remember, we're not talking about the ones who lied, we're not talking about the ones who imagined seeing something else. We're talking about the third category of testimony, real, honest, that will swear. Your own brother, would you believe him if he would tell you that? You wouldn't. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, it's in the Gemara, it's in the Zohar. Now, so therefore we need to know what is the Jewish position in all this? What do we have to say about this? What does this mean? So last week I told you that as far as we know, there is no life in other planets. The physical life at least as we know it to be. Everything is on this earth. But even in this earth, there are different dimensions. There are angels, there are souls and spirits, which we'll talk about another time, ghosts. Why are they running around haunting homes, right? And there are these demons. And what are they for? We spoke about that. They exist in different forms. And some of them are very dangerous. So when you come across a UFO, you know, oh, this is not an alien from another planet. If in fact they are real, all it is is a demon. I say all it is like it's nothing. <laughs> yeah, all it is. It's, but it, it's true, it can be true because we know about them. It's in our source, in our tradition. It's nothing new. Not only is it nothing new, it's in the culture of the Indians, of the Japanese, and other, and the older civilizations, they talk about this freely. So once again, so what happened? The only thing that happened was that in the 19th, 20th, 21st century, because of the scientific revolution, this has been thrown in the garbage. Oh, demons? They don't exist. Well, you know, today everything is physics, and electricity, and, and atoms, and neutrons, and molecules, and, and spaceships, and all this. Demons? What's that? You know, no, nobody has seen that. All of that culture of, or, and, and beliefs, at least in this country, is out the door. But if you go to a place like the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, and you speak to a shluch, only Moroccans know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> right? Then they will tell you, and in Iran too, they will tell you what the jinn is. Huh? Right? Jin. Yeah. You see? Right? How do you know? Did you see one? But you've heard the term. Yes. You know, and you also heard you once mentioned your concept of a Jewish demon and a non-Jewish demon. Yeah, I mentioned that last week. Can you clarify that? Yeah. <laughs> there are some demons that learn Torah, that uh, perform certain mitzvot, pray to Hashem. Yeah. There are some demons, you asked before, Abram, that are, can be helpful. Demons have been used to locate somebody that is lost. But because they have a temper, they're unpredictable, they can be dangerous. So usually you don't want to mess with them. But uh, people have been known to contact them, to look for them, to search them, to uh, ask them to help in certain situations. They can be very helpful. They can really help. Yes? My definition is the demon. Okay, last week we talked about the demons. Demons are half human and half angels. In other words, even though there are different kinds of demons, the ones that look more human, they procreate, they eat, and they die. That, those are the three things that they have in common with human beings. What they have common with the angels is that they have wings, they fly, and they, 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 they cannot be seen, but they can see others. And how do they come to, how do they come to exist? Are they born through a woman? Or do they somehow show up? No, no, they, they have. Again, they procreate amongst themselves in their way. There's male and female. Yeah, anyway, these demons can see us, but they're not always seen. So how do people see them? Because they can make themselves be seen. Just like there is something called an apparition of a ghost, a real apparition which allows the, the eye, the physical eye, to see them, there are times that these demons that are usually not visible, all of a sudden they become visible to us. They want us to be seen. They want them themselves to be seen. So anyway, this may come as a surprise to those of you who are not exposed to this, um, in, because it, it is, I mean, it is in, in, in the Gemara, it is in the Zohar. It's nothing really new for those who have learned about it. It's just that you don't see this every day. Unless, of course, you go to Melrose, you see a bunch of them there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 what? 
No, those don't procreate, yeah. So it's never someone that you see every day that, like, uh, that is... The rabbis tell us to be careful at night to give them, not to give shalom to just anybody because you, be, you may be hands, shaking the hand of a demon. <laughs> anyway, there, there, are, there is quite a bit of uh, Gemarot and Zohar about it. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories soon. So anyway, they appear usually to only to individuals and not to groups of people. And they usually do not come searching for us. It's only if you come to their territory. And the uh, rabbis tell us that the reason why they uh, somehow, sometimes interact with people and, and, and make us trouble is because a demon is a briya pekuma. It is a defective creature. As I explained last week, it's incomplete. It was created at the very, very end. They are therefore lower in quality or in status than human beings. They're considered defective. And because of that, they want to perfect themselves. Somehow, by them interacting or mingling or coming together with human beings, they somehow are able to elevate themselves one level. There have been stories of demons uh, marrying human beings. And these, are, these things are known amongst the Arabs especially. And you may have heard it yourself too. But there are such cases, such incidents, where there was interaction between them. Usually there's not that much interaction, but sometimes there's more. And they, some, somehow they have pleasure from this, or they have a benefit. And that is why they have an interest. Otherwise they keep to themselves. They are not supposed to be uh, mingling with human beings. As I explained last week, that is a favor that God did that does not, he does not allow us to see them, otherwise we would go crazy in seeing all these uh, creatures around us. But from time to time, man, human beings do come in contact with them, and of course they're, sh they're shocked, completely shocked and surprised when they first encounter them, they don't know what they are. Well, yeah. You're saying that famous story about Roswell, New Mexico, for yeah. the demons, you, you suggest they could be, probably were, if it was true, that they were... The Roswell incident in New Mexico, the famous incident, has been documented, there are pictures, but I can't tell for sure, you know, if that was real or not. Very difficult to know. But if it was, then of course it's all, all of this is demons. So, in dealing with UFO sightings, the real ones, all they have to do is with demons. There's nothing else. It's not aliens from some other planets. Yeah. Is what? Is man-made. I'm going to talk about that soon. Yeah, yeah. But what's the language of the demons? What they speak? Any, any particular language? Well, the Persians speak Persian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Farsi. Yeah. Farsi. yeah. Farsi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The, they have their own language. Yeah. The, uh, popular right. uh, description of a UFO as a flying saucer or a mechanical device. Right. Are the demons, uh, is, is that a manifestation of a demon or are they equipped with... Uh, no, they're usually not equipped with these things. They don't need these things to fly around. It is, as I mentioned before, it is their way to, to, uh, to mislead, to deceive, to make fun of human beings by appearing in all these kinds of ships. Uh, it, I don't see that it serves any purpose because they don't really need a mechanism to fly. They're perfectly fit to fly without any spaceship. Is it, are you saying it's an illusion that they... Some of it could be... An, or yes. They manifest, they, they manifest something uh, physical from the metaphysical? No, but they do have the ability, remember I said before, they do have the ability to transform themselves, transform themselves in different shapes and colors and so forth, so they can create this illusion too, that there is something out there which is not, re which is not real. Or it could be something half real that they use for whatever, uh, or whatever it is that they want to accomplish. But it's not, it's not a, a piece of equipment that they really depend on and that they really need to travel on. You know, they're able to fly perfectly fine without anything. What is that? They, 
you know they can change into different shapes and appear as different things all the time. Yeah. What is that? What? No, 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 no. All right. Anyway, the Torah tells us be careful with them, stay away from them, don't worship them. Torah. One of the names that appears in the Torah in describing them is Seirim. Don't get involved with the Seirim. Stay away from them. They're dangerous. They will mislead you. And as I said earlier, in the past, they were much more known. People were more familiar with them. And some people, of course, were attracted to them and used them and wanted to have their help. But the Jews were always warned to stay away from them. Not only for, because of the dangers, but because of the the, the, the possibility of being misled totally from the Torah. Why did Shlomo use one rabbi? I was going to mention that towards the end, but Shlomo Melech did uh, have control over the demons. He did uh, use them from time to time. They obeyed him. And uh, he was able to communicate with them and use them to find certain things that were difficult to find. But it was not on a regular basis. As I said earlier, they, they were used by certain individuals who knew their temperament, knew how to communicate with them, and knew to stay away, not to risk you know anything that would be uh, dangerous. Yeah. All right. Anyway, I'm just going to give you an example of what the rabbis have told us to be careful in one's home concerning demons. One example is do not close a window or a door without opening another opening in the same room. Do you understand that? In other words, let's say you have a window or a door. Do not seal it off completely unless you've made another opening somewhere else. Otherwise you'll have these demons giving you trouble in the home. And there was a story here in this city not, not too long ago, a couple of years ago, where a, ch- a child was telling his father, Daddy, there's a monster underneath my bed. He says, what do you mean a monster underneath my bed? Said, and the father didn't see anything, but the boy somehow was able to see it. And it just happened and happened this way. It was a completely normal boy. So the, so the father went to a rabbi. And the rabbi said, tell me, perhaps you sealed the window? And he says, yeah, just make a hole somewhere in the wall. Make something, some opening. Because they, what, they, what they do is that they have regular roots that they fly through, that they crawl, and somehow if you block it, it disturbs their peace. I don't know why. So if you close the door or window, you want to make sure you open it in another, even in the same room, some other corner, some other spot. Yes? Yes. I'm going to talk about that next. Yeah. So there are, these things do exist usually in rural places. What are they doing in this home? It could be that that home was built after they were there. That's my only explanation. And there are different kinds of demons. There's a demon in the bathroom. There's, there's different kinds, you know, and I don't want to give you a lecture just about demons now. But there are different kinds, and some of them are not as, as uh, a problem as others. Others are called mazikim. They're actually hurt. As I gave an example last week, if somebody drops a glass, you think it just slipped out of his hand? It was a demon that pushed his hand. That made it happen, yes. What do you mean with this? With what? No, I just told you before that many times their interaction, if you're talking about the UFOs, it may have to do with the fact that they derive some benefit from getting involved with human beings. Sometimes it's a benefit that they get. And that is what they take a human being or they use him. At other times, if we're talking about the type that is a mazik, the one that harms, that's his job. There are demons whose job is to hurt people, to punish people. Remember, you were not here for the lecture where we spoke about the system that God has in this world that is similar, I mean, like, this, like the system in this country. You have three branches. You have the legislative, you have the executive, and you have the judicial. So God too, he, he's a le- legislator, but then he has those who execute and those who, who, are the ju- who are the judges, right? The attribute of justice, that carry out punishment over people. What is a tornado? A tornado is a destructive angel. 
instead of calling it a demon, it's called more of a malachi chabala, it's called in Hebrew. Destructive angel. That's all a tornado is. We can explain it in physical terms, a cold front and a hot front mixing together, but if it destroys, it's an angel. And it's hard for people to understand this, unless, you know, of course, they, they study that, because if you're thinking in, in scientific terms, what do you mean angels and demons? <laughs> but that's what this, this cloud is. A cloud that, that comes down and destroys homes. What, what is the fire of Malibu? Destructive angels. But it was a boy that lit the matches. Yeah, that is how it first happens, maybe. That's what they said was one of the fires was somebody lit. Yeah, it doesn't make a difference how it happens. How it starts is something else. But eventually, if that fire rages out of control, destroys and people lose their life, what is that? That is an angel, a destructive angel, who is a messenger of God. He has a system in place of of judging, of carrying out justice, of executing... In the same way that we know it here, he has it up there. Just that we don't see it that way, we're not used to it. That's why I have to explain it to you so that you should understand it. Why these things happen, they don't act, first of all, they don't, act, they don't happen randomly. It's all controlled. Right? And there's a reason for everything. Nothing happens by itself, by chance. There, are some, there is something that's responsible for this. An earthquake you can explain in geological terms. There is a fault. It's called the San Andreas Fault. Yeah, but what makes it shake? Who decides when to shake it? Yes, God uses the fault. Fine. Okay, so there's a fault. But what makes it shake? Everything is from above. This is part of the topic that we talked about a couple of weeks ago called Hashgaha. There's divine providence. Once you understand that he, there's divine providence and supervision, that He is aware and, and of everything that happens, nothing happens without His... Uh, approval, then it's easier to understand. Yes? That's why some homes were stared and the neighbor next door got his home burned. That's right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Old, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Like yeah. Anyway, there are, sh- there are shemirot. There are uh, ways to protect one's home. The best way to protect one's home from demons is to have good mezuzot at the entrance and on your bedroom. The bedroom mezuzot have to be, of course, checked from time to time, the entrance to the home. Any mezuzot has to be checked uh, twice every seven years because sometimes, because of the humidity, even though it may have been a good mezuzah, it may become not kosher. It may lose. It may crack. Uh, you know, some of the letters. Yes, you were going to ask them? What if they're already there? Does the mezuzah No, if the mezuzah is there, they don't usually approach the house. They have to be. They, they have to be driven. There are things that you can say to drive them away. If you have that problem, let me know. <laughs> yeah, there are there are some things that you can do to drive them away. Yeah. Enough for UFOs. The next uh, area that is paranormal are all the mysteries and all the incredible uh, things in this planet that, that don't appear to have a an explanation. One of them is the Bermuda Triangle. Some of you may have heard about the Bermuda Triangle, how many planes have disappeared in that little area not too far from Bermuda. Anybody uh, here that is not unaware of it? Yeah, there, there is such a place. Oh, that's a different topic, another time. Yeah. So what is the Bermuda Triangle? We don't know for sure, because we don't. I mean, there's no, nowhere in the Torah, in the Gemara, that talks about in clear terms of what that area is. But there is an interesting Rashi, Masechet Berachot, that... What? No, no, no. There is an interesting Rashi, Masechet Berachot, that says that there are places in the, in the ocean that cannot tolerate metal. And the boats that travel through them, through those areas, need to have everything made out of wood and rope. Okay, that's, the, that's what the Rashi says. So some wanted to point to that Rashi as an explanation of the Bermuda Triangle. In my opinion, that does not do justice to the Bermuda Triangle because it does not explain how planes disappear. How boats, perhaps? Maybe. It may have more to do with what Rashi is saying. It may have more to do with the with the Kocha Amishikawa Sheiva, the magnet, the magnetic force of the poles. It could be something to do with that magnetic force 
that is why metal is, is not tolerated in some spots of the ocean. But I don't know if that has to do with the Bermuda Triangle. Maybe yes, some say it could be a problem of magnets there. It still does not explain planes disappearing. One possibility is that it has to do with something called, or abbreviated in Hebrew, Samach Aleph. Samach Aleph you will find in the Zohar, and the Kabbalah stands for Sitra Achara. Sitra Achara is the other side. So the words mean other side. The impure forces in this world. There are impure forces. There are demons. There are all kinds of forces in this world that we need to reckon with. And some of them are dangerous. Why that particular spot is, is not known. All we do know is that the demons have certain locations. One of them is supposed to be in the North Pole. And it was in very desolate places. Very far away. The Bermuda Triangle is not close to the North Pole, but it could be another location. I'm, I'm not sure, but it is possible that all these accidents that have happened, and some of them are normal accidents, planes crash, but a few could be attributed to other powers that exist out there that we do not know. It could be impure forces, or it could be something that we're unaware of. We don't know everything, right? There are things in this world that we're unaware of that they exist. So, what is, what is it most likely? I wouldn't be surprised if it has something to do with the Sitra Hara, with the Tum'ah, with some tr- tremendous power that is not allowing anything to escape. Why does it work sometimes, not other times? I'm not sure. The next, the next uh, concept is unusual creatures, animals. What about them? Dragons and all kinds of things that uh, were depicted in, uh, in the literatures of Greece and Rome. What do we have to say about monsters? Did monsters exist? Do they exist? You know that in Scotland there's a lake where they say that there's a Loch Ness Monster. What about that? What about dinosaurs? So first of all, all the dragons that spit fire, have you heard about them? You know, there are dragons that spit fire. You want to see one? What? 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 Yeah, there are creatures. There are there are very very uh, incredible creatures in this world that are described in the Gemara and the Mishnayot. And you wonder to yourself, wait a minute, where are they? All kinds of creatures. Now there is one creature that the rabbis tell us clearly. It came about for a short period of time, and Hashem took it away. It was called the Tachash. The Tachash from the skins of the Tachash. They made the hides to make the roof of the, of the Mishkan. It was colorful. It's no longer around. It had, by the way, it had a horn. Yeah, it had a horn. Yeah, the Tachash. No longer around. There are animals that are no longer around. Why aren't they around? So I explained that before when we talked about dinosaurs. Either their mission is accomplished, there's no need for them, or they simply became extinct. Animals can become extinct because they don't have the blessing that the fish received. The fish received the blessing because people catch them. The Japanese eat a lot of sushi, right? So we need to have a lot of fish in this world. So therefore, Hashem gave them a blessing. There should be lots of fishes, a lot of tuna. So regular animals don't have. There are only a few thousand tigers left in the world. You know that? About 3,000, let's say. Maybe a couple more. They're not, they're not an unlimited amount. What happens here is there are, there are animals... There are animals that have not been seen, that exist, because people haven't uh, discovered everything that there is. And every, every year, scientists find in the depths of the oceans, in all sorts of corners of the jungles of the earth, all sorts of species that they have not seen, of all sorts of animals. So it's very possible that some of these creatures that were considered monsters or strange will be discovered one day. Or they could have been around one time and they became extinct. Some of the dragons that are described could have been dinosaurs because they look alike. Yeah. Now, what about a mermaid? Do you know that mermaids exist? Yeah. Mermaids, half fish, half woman. And there were some fishermen in the 1850s who saw it right off the coast of Massachusetts. How come we don't see it that too often? I don't have an answer for that. Maybe there are not too many. Maybe they're, they just don't come off the coast too often. But they do exist. It's, it's written in the Gemara. So it's not just something that, you know, that the Goim made up. Myth. You know, 
Some think that, that all these things are myth. Okay, just to finish up, I, I'm going to tell you a few stories. Um, but before we get to the stories, we've talked about animals, weird animals, we've talked about demons, we've talked about UFOs, we've talked about uh, all sorts of weird things that are, is all called paranormal. But in the very beginning, in the introduction, I talked about ESP and paranormal uh, activities that human beings have. What should we say about somebody like Uri Geller? Or people the, the like that have shown or demonstrated all sorts of paranormal abilities? What is that supposed to be? Okay. I, I'm not, I cannot give any opinion unless I've investigated the, the man. So I cannot give an honest opinion as to where he takes those powers from. I can only tell you it is possible that human beings can have certain powers. But what did I say earlier? What we are interested to know is what's the source of it. Is it from Kedusha or from Tuma? That's all. If it's a total lie, there are a lot of imposters that we know. Magicians, tricks. If it's Kishuv, like you said, witchcraft, that's impure. That's an impure force. So we want to know, what we want to know is where it comes from. Are we impressed? No. Because we know certain things exist. There are individuals who are gifted. Hashem gave them a matana. That they are able to see certain things, they are able to know certain things, they are able to do certain things through the powers of concentration. Through the powers of concentration, meditation, whatever you want to call it. It is possible. The Torah has no problem. We don't, it's not a contradiction to anything we know. On the contrary, we find enough sources that, sh that basically... Uh, point that there are such abilities. We just want to know if they're for real and if it's from the Kedusha or from the Tuma. Therefore, all a Jew has to do is to be careful that he's not misled. It could be, yeah. He's not misled into believing something which Chazm Shalom could, uh, could influence him in the wrong way. That is why Jews have to be careful with superstitions superstitious beliefs there are many superstitious beliefs that are totally unfounded Friday the 13th on the contrary 13 is a great number by us bar mitzvah you have nothing nothing to fear with the number 13 yeah so you, you know a lot of these things come from goyim and if they come from a non-jewish source stay away from it unless you know that it comes from a Jewish source that it's something that you, sh that you should reckon with you don't have to have any fears. What comes out of all of these, of these uh, paranormal activities and events and sightings, if anything good comes out of it, is the Hezuk In other words, if one is strengthened, if his emunah is strengthened to see that there is in fact a soul, that there is, there is in fact other creatures in this world who act in who do Hashem's will, if that can help him, then that's fine. Then you can, he's allowed to read, read books about it. There are some excellent books I told you about NDE experiences that the Goim experience. A couple of stories about demons and ghosts, real quickly. They always existed, and we've had them all, all along. And uh, there are Jews from Burma, from Iraq, Morocco, that know of, of uh, incidents that occurred in their own families, in their own home. I heard it, I heard it from one gentleman, I don't know if anybody was here in LA 30 years ago, but about 30 years ago there was a restaurant on 30th Street called Exotic. Anybody, I don't know if you were here 30 years ago, you would remember the story, you, you remember the restaurant, there was another restaurant called Two Worlds, vegetarian Indian restaurant anyway uh, they were from Burma and I was speaking to the owner of exotic restaurant Mr. Joseph Alaba Shalom passed away years ago and he told me when he was a child in Burma they had visitors demons every other day coming to they already were familiar with them and what did I tell you before? Some of them are unpredictable. They have a temper. And one day, the, the, this, this guy, when he was a child, he was sleeping on the bed. And all of a sudden, he wakes up in the morning, the bed is against the ceiling. They were trying to crush them against the ceiling. They picked up the bed. They saw it. it was, 
there was nobody underneath it. But they, they knew right away who it was, who was trying to hurt them, and they immediately jumped off the bed. Just one little story that he related to me when we started talking about this, this uh, common phenomenon to them. Oh, of course, we saw them all the time. They, <laughs> they used to enter our homes, they used to visit, and this is one day what they did to us. There have been many stories of spirits and ghosts that have been seen, including the ghost of Lincoln in the White House knocking on the door, putting on his boots by people who can actually swear to the fact that they saw it. But we won't be talking about ghosts right now, that's for another time. Yes? I was going to say, uh, why didn't why did those ghosts get reincarnated? Why well, I'll just tell you briefly, ghosts are usually disembodied spirits of individuals who were usually murdered, killed. They don't have to, they don't, they're not always at peace. There are stories in England of, uh, of all sorts of uh, ghosts that have been seen, you know, trying to hitchhike, getting in the car and all of a sudden vanishing. Yeah. All sorts of, of incidents where somebody saw something and they, dis they disappeared. There are, these things do exist. It's, it's not a contradiction to anything we know. And on the contrary, it, it only reinforces what we already know. Yes. I just want to tell you one more story. There was a gentleman here in, in L.A. about 20, 25 years ago that was going to Las Vegas, I think. And as you know, there's a lot of desert in between here and Vegas. And uh, it was some, it was some, somewhere, somewhere between 9 and 10 at night. And... Uh, he just stopped somewhere in the desert. I guess he had to take care of some needs, maybe. That's why he, he stopped, uh, parked his car, and went out. It was completely desert. And all of a sudden, he hears somebody laughing. He hears a voice laughing at him. He turns around, there's nobody there. And it wasn't a hyena. There are no hyenas there, as far as I know. It was a human being. I think it, that's what he thought it was, but he didn't see anybody. And he asked what it could be. And of course, those who are knowledgeable told him, you probably encountered a demon. Because they are known to laugh and to make fun and to sometimes hurt people who are by themselves, alone. So it's not a good idea to ever go alone at night, especially. Why at night? Because the t night is the time when they usually come out. Well, I have an idea to go to Vegas at all. Yeah, to Vegas, for sure. Yeah. 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 Anyway, there are many, many stories. And basically they prove the same thing, that these things exist. I just want to finish with a very important point. We talked about all sorts of paranormal activities and paranormal beings. And somebody asked about how one can protect himself. We spoke about mezuzot. But you don't take a mezuzah with you when you're going in the street. Right? How do you protect yourself when you're not in your home? Our tradition is very, very clear about this. That if a Jew observes the mitzvot, he observes family purity, he does not commit any terrible sins. In other words, he's not involved with a non-Jewish woman. He sticks, in other words, to the Torah. He has less reasons to be afraid. He has more protection. He has angels that protect him. But even somebody like that who is immune, is not completely immune. As we will see, there's something called an evil eye. There are forces out there who are, that are dangerous. And one cannot immunize himself completely to all of them. Therefore, the rabbis tell us, no matter how much of a tzaddik you are, you got to be aware of certain things. Don't do certain things. Don't go to certain places at night. Don't sleep in a house by yourself. 